I would say, you know, for those of you who are now um, starting off, either from, you know, uh, high school, um, uh, uh, university or, or early career, just do something you enjoy doing. And, and just make sure it's something you have a natural knowledge in. Some people are good in certain areas and some are not. Um, I've had students come to me and say they want to do research and they are bright, but I know that it's not in them to do it. And I, and, and I tell them, look, you know, this is not for you. You are good at ABC. Why not try that instead? So I would say, yeah, follow, follow your passion, but ensure that it aligns with your ability and ignore all the stuff with money, et cetera, that will come um, over time as long as you, you do what you like. That's, that's how I, and again, the three things I look for in a job is um, flexibility, being able to work when I want and where I want, um, interest in work, and then of course, yeah, um, benefits or compensation. But the first two are, are more, more important to me. Uh, so I, I would advise people just be happy in what you do. In this episode, you'll learn about Dr. Patrick Hosine. Dr. Hosine was one of the early pioneers of the computing industry, both in the US and Trinidad and Tobago. He has five degrees from MIT, five. A PhD in electrical engineering and computer science, two masters, one in electrical engineering and the other in computer science, and two bachelor's degrees in math and electrical engineering. Dr. Hosine has worked as a principal engineer from notable research labs and companies such as Nokia's Bell Labs, AT&T Labs, Ericsson, and Huawei. He is also a full professor at the University of the West Indies, where he is pioneering AI education and research in the Caribbean region with his group, TT Lab. Dr. Hosine's journey is a shining example of how hard work can take you from a small island to doing valuable work at the global level and then giving back to build up local talent. Enjoy the show. There we go. The show where we talk about data science in the Caribbean, highlighting practical ways that you can learn, be involved, and create your own impact using artificial intelligence and machine learning. This is the Caribbean Data Science Podcast with Mark Moyu and Jeff Sayon. All right. Hello, everyone. We're here again for another one of our Caribbean Data Science interview series. And we're very privileged to have Dr. Patrick Hussain, who is a professor at UE. And Patrick, welcome. Thank you for having me, Jeff. So we have some incredible ground to cover uh, based on your uh, immaculate career, if I could call it that. Um, we are going to link in the description of this video some additional footage. Uh, doc, Dr. Hussain was the recipient of one of the Ansel McCall Awards for Excellence a few years ago, and there was a good video done by that. We'll, we'll, we'll set that up in the description so that you guys could learn a more broad understanding of his background and his accomplishments. But today, since the focus of this series is on data science, AI, machine learning, we're gonna to talk to him about that. So Patrick, let me ju just jump right in if that's okay. And sure. let's talk about what you're working on currently. Okay, so um, before I do that, Jeff, uh, you've been a scenes man as well. Uh, I, I, for the other scenes people are, are listening. Um, I just wanna mention I'm, I'm, I'm also um, um, in the uh, scenes, um, what's it called, the, the Hall of Fame. Uh -huh. um, so with, together with people like Father Life, Hook, et cetera. So yeah. I, I always bring that up um, because I, I think it's, you know, it's, a, 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 it's something I, I, um, I, I feel gratified for. But in terms of um, what else I do, um, besides being a professor in, in computer science, uh, I run a company called uh, TTNIC, Trinidad and Tobago Network Information Center. The company manages the .tt domain and this is something I started way back in the 90s uh, when we first got internet access in Trinidad. Um, over the years, I've continued doing that and, uh, and, and still do that today. Uh, as part of that, um, we also provide uh, free hosting and domain names for all schools, all educational institutions in Trinidad. 
And I personally um, support um, the technical aspects of that, um, that, that project. So if, if a school needs um, St. Mary's or ed.tt, they apply to us and we provide them with resources to set it up. Terrific. It's becoming even more important these days with um, online education. Um, there's also, uh, I'm also uh, part of a, a, another group called TTMAG, Trinidad and Tobago Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. And this was formed by TTNIC to provide um, advice on internet governance in Trinidad and Tobago, in particular um, policies for the .tt domain. Um, so it consists of um, stakeholders from multiple, um, uh, from, from academia, from government, from um, uh, civic society, et cetera. Then uh, there's TT Lab, and, and you see a trend here, TT Nick, TT Mac, TT Lab. <laughs> but, so TT Lab was, is, is a, it's not a formal um, research group, but it's a, a, a collection of uh, individuals who are interested in doing research. Um, it consists ma mainly of uh, uh, people from UE, students from UE, uh, undergrad, postgrad, um, from different disciplines, you know, we have people from uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, statistics, mathematics, computer science, data science, economics. So we all get together and, and jointly do, uh, do research. Um, I'm also uh, 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 part of a company called Div Solutions. And, and this company was formed to solve uh, an issue we had. So as part of my... Um, research group, what I try to do is get internships uh, for students in industry. So they work on real problems uh, and, and use data science to apply to, to real industry problems. These internships tend to be on the order of you know, one year or, or six months or one year. Um, and, and in most cases, we come up with um, novel solutions. Um, we publish the work and we provide a, a proof of concept for the company. Unfortunately, we, can, we cannot take it beyond that point. We cannot develop a, a commercial um, product uh, platform for the company um, because you know, that's, that's not, not, not our main uh, objective. So Div Solutions was formed to kind of take over from that point. Um, and so Div Solutions provides the ongoing maintenance and, uh, um, and upgrades for, for whatever platform we, we design. Um, I'm, I'm also uh, leading a UE data science cluster, which is meant to improve collaboration across campuses in the area of AI and data science. Um, so we have um, campuses on, in, in St. Augustine, uh, Mona, Jamaica, Keeville, Barbados. Then there's the um, um, Five Island campus as well. So I'm trying to get all the individuals from these uh, different campuses who are interested in machine learning, et cetera, to, to collaborate in some ways. And, and we've started doing some of that with Barbados, for instance. We're also part of another lab, D4D lab. So uh, another thing we try to do is, is in addition to um, using data science for industrial problems, um, we want to solve some, some problems in society as well, so have a societal impact. Um, so we collaborate with a, a organization called uh, the Cropper Foundation um, in, in, in doing some of that type of work. So that um, Cropper Foundation has this lab called D4D and we, we are part of that. Um, so that, that in a nutshell is some of the other stuff we uh, presently do. I don't think it'll fit in a nutshell, maybe a large coconut, but uh, that's <laughs> that, there's a really fantastic array of of, of ventures and efforts, Patrick. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't think it would be unfair to say that you are a true veritable resource for anyone who wants to get involved in data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning across the Caribbean or even around the world. So um, we're really lucky to have you here, and congratulations on all of those efforts. Um, you were an early pioneer, and we'll talk more about this as we go through, on bringing the internet to Trinidad. Uh, you pioneered many technologies in your days back and forth between the U.S. And, and the Caribbean in terms of cellular technology and cloud technology. You have, I'm guessing by now, over 80 patents. Is that right? Uh, no, it's uh, about 40 patents. <laughs> 40, 40, okay. Uh, yeah. 40 going on 80 at some point soon, uh, depending on, on when they get granted. Um, 
and uh, you work with a lot of people both in the Caribbean, in the U.S., and and globally, who whose careers align with uh, all of the things you just mentioned, correct? Yes, yes. Right, that's terrific. That's terrific. Now, you specifically mentioned uh, AI, machine learning, data science. So we like to start up front and make sure everybody has common ground in terms of what you mean when you talk about those three distinct aspects. So could you give us your definition of AI versus machine learning versus data science? And how do you see them interplaying with regard to the type of stuff you work on? Okay, so when I when I hear AI, I always think about the, the general uh, definition. You know, so there's general AI, which is um, you know re uh, replicating the, the 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 human thought process in a computer, which we kind of do right now. And then there's narrow AI, which is what we focus on these days with machine learning. Um, so AI, in my mind, is more on the general AI side of things, and so I, I prefer to to refer to the work we do as as data science. Mm -hmm. uh, now, machine learning is a little bit more specific in that it basically, um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, taking um, data, um, putting it through a computer, the computer extracts, uses an algorithm to extract patterns, et cetera, and then you, you replicate the uh, decision-making process for new data. Um, right. So it's specific to that. Now, data science, on the other hand, is, is, is more general. It includes machine learning, but it includes a lot of additional um, uh, techniques and tools uh, that you would find from traditional statistics, um, from op operations research, uh, optimization, et cetera. So it's a, a bigger tool toolkit that you would apply to, to problems you face in industry, um, process optimization, et cetera. So that's my general view right. on things. And so as a practitioner and somebody that's been involved in multiple companies, as well as a, a professor of computer science, what would you say are the traits that allow someone to become successful in becoming a data scientist? Let's say there was someone today in high school who wanted to learn more about this field or someone at university level who wanted to lean into becoming more qualified in the field of data science. How? What, what thoughts would you share about what makes someone a, a, a solid data scientist? Okay, so if you're talking about uh, uh, um, high school students, I would say yes, you know, check, check the technologies available today, et cetera, play around with app development, but focus right now on the basics because it's important to have the basics um, in, in things like probability, linear algebra, calculus, um, because what I find these days is a lot of students um, uh, just applying techniques without understanding what, what's happening underneath. So we get students at UE, for instance, who do not know sufficient probability, for instance, to understand some of the algorithms that, 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 that uh, uh, um, uh, are used. So yeah, uh, I would say focus on getting the, the, the basic education as we did, as both of us did at, at St. Mary's, um, doing, you know, uh, I did a, a pure math, applied math, physics, um, and I enjoy that. Um, so, so at the high school level, focus on getting the basics. When you get, get into university, the, you know, I would advise ensuring that you pursue a field that combines your interest with what you are naturally capable of doing. So some people are good at, at you know, uh, science, some are good at math, et cetera. Don't force yourself into something that you're not good at or you're not interested in. Um, now, I, I know in, in Trinidad, you know, um, there's, there's always this pressure from parents to become a, 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 a doctor, a lawyer, et cetera. So there's that uh, issue as well. Maybe in the 60s, but we're in a completely different revolution today, which we'll talk about. Well, yeah, but I, I still come across students who say, you know, oh, they, they would have liked to do ABC, but their parents would prefer they do something else. So it's, it still happens, but not as much as, as before. Uh, in terms of um, um, early career um, uh, professionals, my advice is to try as many things as you can as possible. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot to learn out there. 
and you may you know find out that what you're doing right now is not what you really would like to do and there, there may be something else um, that might be better uh, um, that you're more interested in or you are uh, you have the natural capability for yeah uh, <clears throat> the <clears throat> Just to give an example, um, prior to UE, I believe I had moved around around um, to different companies on an average of over five every five years. So I moved, you know, from um, company to company. Five. Now the reason I'm I'm at UE for the last ten years is it gives me the flexibility to do a wide range of things. So. Um, you know, whereas in, in industry, you know, you have to focus on on, on the main job you have. Mm. Um, at Bell Labs, contrast. Was, yeah. yeah, at Bell Labs, it, it was a little different. You had flexibility, but these days, you know, if you go to, to these uh, uh, high tech companies, you, you have to focus on a specific area, uh, contribute in that area, um, which gives you, you know, less flexibility to, to learn completely different um, fields. Yeah. So at, at UE now, I, you know, I, I, I enjoy doing work in electrical engineering, doing wireless communications work, doing work with, um, in, in economics, in, in, in health. So I, I guess that's, that's one of the reasons I, I, I've been sticking around so long. Yeah, terrific. Let's, since you mentioned Bell Labs, for, for those who don't know what that is and what it was at the time, what would you say is the equivalent company today to Bell Labs and how would you describe that environment? Well, I, I guess uh, <clears throat> the equivalent would be companies like Google and, 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 and Facebook and Qualcomm, right. um, especially in, 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 in the communications uh, area, I guess Qualcomm um, right. would, be, would be equivalent. And uh, why did you go to Bell? Okay, well, so when I when I uh, completed my PhD, um, <clears throat> I wanted to do research. I had no interest really in teaching, and in those days, you know, the two biggest research labs were probably Bell Labs and uh, IBM, uh, T.J. Watson, um, and uh, so I went there to do research in in optimization, which is, was my my area of uh, expertise. Um, but uh, because I was on a J-1 visa, <clears throat> having been on a scholarship, a, a national scholarship, I could only uh, spend 18 months at Bell Labs. So that's when I, I returned home. Uh, my, my first return to Trinidad was, was um, after Bell Labs. Now, you did your PhD also at MIT in addition to your bachelor's and master's. In those days, doing a PhD was not uh, an easy thing, especially at a place like MIT. It, it isn't easy today. What uh, motivated you to do a PhD and what were some of the things that you feel you got coming out of Trinidad that uh, allowed you to endure the, uh, the journey of, of completing that um, enormously strenuous program? Well, for one thing, I have to say the, the, uh, the high school education I got in Trinidad was, was top class. <clears throat> um, when I, when I um, got to MIT, you know, you I was intimidated by by all these bright people, but then I realized, in terms of the mathematics and physics background I had, mm -hmm. um, I, I was sort of ahead of the game. Right. I wasn't, you know, when it came to programming, I wasn't near where where they were. But um, <clears throat> so that gave me a head start, and and that's why I was able to complete my degree early and 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 do a, a double degree. You know, because mm -hmm. the government was paying for four years, I might as well right. stay four years. And what was the international class at MIT like in your days? Um, well, it was it was yeah mostly uh, foreigners in, in in my day. Um, you know, I can't. It depends on on the the area, but in engineering, uh, specifically in electrical and computer engineering or electrical engineering and computer science, as as, as they call it. Um, yeah, there was a high percentage of uh, foreigners. What, but like what, how many West Indians out of MIT's international population at the time? Oh, it was, it was, I would say there was probably, you know, one Trinidadian every <laughs> four years or so. So um, you were alone for, for the most part. <laughs> yeah, when I, when I, when I was there, there was, a, I believe there was a, go, a, a guy named Barcon, Colin Barcon, Barcon. Um, but besides that, yeah, there, there, there weren't um, many Trinidadians. Who did you, which, which, which people did you find yourself making friends with as a Trinidadian? Oh, the, the Caribbean, you know, the, there were other Caribbean people from Jamaica, etc. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> um, 
So we did form, uh, I believe we were the ones that formed the Caribbean um, um, Society, or I forget what the name of the, the, the group is. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, we, we got together and, and um, I met people like um, a, a colleague of mine at, at UV right now, uh, Kim Ali Liu. Uh -huh. She was at MIT at that time. So, um, so yeah, there, there was some Caribbean um, community, but not, not as big as it probably is now. I mean, now there are a lot more um, Carib uh, Trinidadians and, 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 and people from the Caribbean in, in, at MIT. I hope so. I hope so. And, and, and also uh, wherever they go and regardless of whether it's MIT or not, uh, we have a lot of people aspiring into this field. So let's, let's talk a bit about that. So um, after Bell Labs, you decided to teach. So it sounds like initially there was not the, the urge to teach for you, but um, how did that emerge for you? Well, uh, you know, as I said, um, <clears throat> after Bell Labs, I needed to, to return home because, you know, you, you, based on the scholarship, you need to return to, uh -huh. your country for, for at least three years. Uh -huh. and, and so when I got back there, I wanted to do research and the only option was really to do it at, at UE. So right. that's when I joined the um, electrical engineering department at UE. Um, and uh, at, at that time, Professor Julian was there and he really, um, he really gave me uh, full support in, in, in research. And, and he was the one who gave me the, um, the resources I need to, 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 to bring the internet to UE in, in those early days. Because so let's talk about that as you bring that up. So mm -hmm. you were an early pioneer of bringing the internet to Trinidad. What was, what was that, um, what was layer one back in those days? Okay, so, so when I returned, of course I wanted to continue some of the research I had started at Bell Labs and um, in order to do that, you know, you, we, we couldn't communicate with, but by postal mail, we needed email. So I needed email and there was no, um, there was no internet access at UE at that point. We did have computers, we had a computer lab, et cetera. And this um, was late, late 80s, early 90s, correct? Yeah, this was early 90s. So right. what, what I did was um, I was able to um, join this, um, jo join this uh, uh, program where, I could dial in to Puerto Rico um, and uh, I had a, 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 a well, f first of all, I needed to get permission to, to, to use our phone lines to dial to Puerto Rico. So Professor Julian, again, he said, okay, um, we have a fax line. You could use that on evenings from four to five. So uh, from four to five on evenings, I would um, use a Unix workstation, dial in to Puerto Rico form that uh, dial-up connection and then use that to interconnect the university uh, wide area, uh, local area network. And then you would have students on the, in the computer, um, computer center accessing the internet through that dial-up connection. And, and let's uh, just contextualize it for our audience today. So what, what modem speed were you talking about dialing all the way to Puerto Rico from Trinidad yeah. in those days? Well, and so you're talking about an international link. So you, we, we're talking about like 28 kilobits per second. 28 speed. kilobits per second. And 5G today is, is how fast? Well, it, it depends. But yeah, we talk about, you know, gigabits per second, you know, so. So li it, literally. It's several orders of magnitude different. Almost a billion times faster in, yeah. in the space of 20 years. And, and that is that is a, a whole country compared to one individual on a cell phone. Right. Yeah. So of course we were limited in what we could do, and and, and things like email, we would have to use um, protocols like UUCP and, and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it was primitive, um, but we um, yeah, and, and we were using things like Mosaic, which is the early browser. Yeah. Um, but it gave us the opportunity to start playing around with these, um, with the internet. Yeah. Um, and when, when TSCT, which is the local uh, telephone company, decided they, they wanted to offer internet services and, and form an ISP, um, we submitted a proposal to do it for them and we won. And, and this, was, this was unheard of because in those days, you know, local companies didn't have the, you know, confidence in, in, in you know, a bunch of UE people doing something such as that. Right. So we won, we won that. We developed um, 
software to manage the modems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, as, as we were discussing earlier, Jeff, some of your uh, colleagues were part of that, um, Kevin Blackman and Jason Anano and Ronald Lessi. Um, they right. were the, the developers of the software. Right, uh, we well definitely as, have to credit them here for posterity. Uh, yeah. I don't know many, if many people know the names of the team and, and then the folks over at Tidco led by Simon Fraser or the IBM who pioneered the early days of the internet, but you, yourself included, of course. Right. In fact, this was a joint um, proposal between um, us and, and um, IBM. So right. IBM provided the hardware and we provided the, we, we developed the software. Because in those days, there was no software off the shelf that you could use for this. So we actually developed all the management software, et cetera. Uh, so it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a terrific lesson learned there. So it, it shows how one's passion and for collaboration and, and commitment to academic research and moving a field forward uh, enable you to, I guess, apply the mother of, of invention to create what was needed for the country to get on the internet in the early days. And, and, and today, people probably take Trinidad and Tobago, one of the highest concentrations of cellular access per capita in the world, take for granted the fact that we're on the internet. But um, I'm glad we could at least talk about where that story started for, for history's purpose. Um, you and I also had a chance to touch history in 1994 or thereabouts. I think we brought the World Wide Web down on a laptop because we didn't have enough bandwidth to actually access the servers at MIT um, at the time. So we, we, we downloaded everything and put it on a laptop and we, we ran a little seminar. Can you recount what the audience was like and how many people from the press and government came to that? Uh, to be honest, Jeff, I <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't memorable, it, right? That, that, it was, that's the point. Yeah, it, uh, we I went to the Hilton. We went to the Hilton. It was a huge promotion, and uh, I think we had one journalist and maybe two people yeah. from industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in those days, the, the thing is, it wasn't very. Uh, you know, for instance, when we we um, when we submitted this proposal to TSTT, we had to demonstrate what we could do. And right. the one thing was uh, Kevin Blackman. Mm -hmm. Use a browser to, dis to, to, to show a brief click of a clip of a, a cricket match. Mm -hmm. And so in, back in those days, remember doing that was very difficult because- Absolutely. You know, it's, it, um, but yeah, it, um, it no was- No such thing as real-time video back then. Right, it was underwhelming and, you know, but people couldn't, um, um, People Con were not willing to, to see in the future the, keep the, the potential for it. Couldn't um, connect the dots. Yeah, uh, in, in particular, I mean, I'll be blunt about this. One, one professor at UE said, oh, the internet is just a playground for students. So they saw it more like, you know, you're gonna go there and play games, et cetera. So right. there was uh, little foresight in those days. Yeah. Right, and we had similar responses from other business leaders and obviously um, people in government. Let's talk about today, just to kind of jump ahead. So we're pioneering the fourth industrial revolution today, where massively parallel computational architectures combined with incredible fields of data and incredible knowledge that's been gathered over the years on the internet uh, can all be harnessed to do something very, very different. Um, what are some of the parallels that you are seeing today? What are some of the efforts you're trying to introduce? And uh, how are those analogies perhaps going to help people start to see the next big revolution that countries, e emerging economies like, you know, Caribbean economies like Trinidad and Tobago and, and other countries around the world uh, have to start paying attention to and have to start participating in for them to participate in this fourth industrial revolution? Right, so you know, we, we tend to follow, um, which is you know, the government tends to follow what other countries do as opposed to taking the initiative to, to say, okay, look, this has potential, let's, let's dive into it early on and see what happens. So the same thing happened with the internet. We, we got it, but we got it later that you know, we, we should have, we could have gotten it earlier. Um, now, there's a lot to talk about innovation and, and coming up with um, products that we could um, increase foreign exchange, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a lot of effort in diving in straight into innovation. 
Now, you know, in some cases, yes, you, you can develop something without some of the um, advanced knowledge you would need in, in some of these um, technologies. But um, all the emphasis is on, or, or most of the emphasis is on app development or software development. And, and that, that, um, that has passed. That, that mm -hmm. you know, those days have, have passed. We have to go beyond that now. Mm -hmm. and, and develop the underlying technologies or the underlying algorithms that, that power these apps, um, which requires, you know, data science, um, uh, some of the, the uh, you know, the algorithms, you know, Facebook and Google and all of these are based on really top-notch algorithms, right? So the, the front end is, is interesting, but the back end is where, where, where the, interest, the more um, knowledge-based stuff comes in. Uh, so that's where we need to, to place more focus on educating and doing research in data science um, and, and, you know, uh, all the other related um, technologies. So my, my push is on, on doing that from an education side. Um, for instance, I started an MSc in data science um, four years ago. Um, <clears throat> I proposed a PhD in data science a, a couple of years ago, and, and that was turned down by the university. I, I would say for... I'll, I'll uh, sign up as one of your, of your yeah, students. They, they, unfortunately, it was turned on for, for reasons that, um, you know, were not uh, logical. But anyway. Maybe, uh, maybe you can just chew to me on this side and we'll convince you <laughs> to give me a degree. Well, because the, the, the it's, reason... Because it's Dr. Patrick was signed. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the reason for pushing that is what, what happens is that Data science, you could have people with different backgrounds doing a PhD in data science, people with electrical, with computer science, with statistics. And unfortunately, what was happening is if somebody wanted to apply for a PhD um, in the computer science department, they had to have a computer science um, undergrad degree. Uh -huh. And um, so I wanted to get us away from that by introducing a PhD in data science. And for that PhD, you could have different types of backgrounds, backgrounds in, in statistics or computer science, whatever, and still be able to do a data science PhD. Um, if, you, if you got funding for such a program, would you still be interested in making it happen? Well, I, I don't think it's so much um, uh, the funding because the PhD program is, is low cost uh, mm -hmm. at UV right now, um, <clears throat> but the... I believe if I try to push it down, it, it will go through. But when I when I tried to do it about, uh, it was about two or three years ago, the people didn't really appreciate. Again, didn't appreciate the value that uh, AI would um, right. would provide. But that and has so changed quite a bit. That has changed quite a bit since then. How, how, again, long, how long do you think a, a student who would qualify in your mind it would take them to receive to earn such a PhD? Um, at, at UE, it, it depends, but um, I would say between three to five years, they can. That's very um, competitive, very yeah. competitive. Yeah. Um, but of course, you have to have the, the resources, you have to have the um, right supervision, et cetera. And, and um, would, you, would you see such a program being distributed given our time of COVID, or would people have to be admitted and physically on campus with you? No, no need to be on campus. Um, yeah. I mean, look, look, I'm supervising about 30 students right now and I'm in San Diego. Right. Um, so there's no need to be in physical contact with anybody anymore. We would not have thought that given the wonderful planting trees we see behind yeah, us there. Yeah, well, but... that's, that's my San Diego um, backyard there with um, trying to grow some tropical trees, sapodilla and, and planting, et cetera. But, but yeah, so, so just, you know, the fact that we could now teach from anywhere, um, means a couple of things, you know, we could now attract other people worldwide uh -huh. to teach courses at UE uh -huh. without having to physically go to Trinidad. Right. All right. That's one thing. Um, we could also now attract students worldwide because anybody, uh -huh. anybody worldwide could, uh, um, could, could join these programs. So there's a lot more flexibility in, 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 in how we can um, provide programs, but the bu bureaucracy makes it a little bit difficult to, to make these changes, and, and that's sure. one of the issues we have. But sure. um, well, maybe, that will, that will, maybe that will change in the coming months. Let's see. Yeah, well, COVID, COVID has forced uh, a change. 
um, you know, in, 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 um, before COVID, I mean, if I told them, look, I, I want to go back to San Diego for a couple months and teach from there, they would say, no, 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 no way at all. Uh, even for meetings, you know, we would have to sometimes go in physically to, to, to the university for meetings. Yeah. Um, but now, you know, everything is online. So, so now right. COVID has, has um, shifted things quite a bit in, in my favor, I have to say, yeah. um, because now I could teach remotely. Um, and, and, and just to give another example, my, my, my son, uh, he teaches a course at, at UC Davis uh -huh. and he decided to go to Barbados and teach. So he is actually doing the reverse of, of, of me. Uh, he's in the Caribbean teaching here. Uh, I'm here teaching in the Caribbean. So yeah, it COVID just, has, it's really uh, forced our world to truly embrace the reality of the internet and, and operate yeah. in a much more global diverse fashion. It, it's incredible. Right, uh, well, so, so it feels, yeah, you need to have that physical contact, but, but data science, which is just, mis, you know, uh, um, pen and paper and, 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 and computer that then you don't need to, to have that physical contact. Yeah, let's go back to the fourth industrial revolution. Talk about some of the projects you and the folks that you work with have been doing. Uh, first of all, tell us a bit about the people you choose to work with and, and, and what are the type of projects that you feel very proud of, of showcasing that represents this coming revolution in industry? So the, the students uh, come from a, a wide range of, of backgrounds. Um, so I have my postgrad students, mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of MSc students doing their MSc in data science, but um, also um, APs, uh, associate professionals. These are returning scholars or, or local scholars who now have to serve their three years. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes we have these bright students coming back from you know, Cornell and, and some top universities they come back to Trinidad and they end up in a ministry doing trivial stuff. Right. So I, I try to attract these students to come and, and do research with me. Um, sometimes in, in, the, in the area that they were doing research um, when they were doing their undergrad uh -huh. um, and publish. So Very exciting. Very main exciting. Focus, main focus is publishing. Um, yeah. uh, and we also have people who have gone into industry, but they are not challenged in an industry. So they want to do something research wise. And so they work with me. Um, and some companies actually give them time to work with me. So I have this reverse internship program where uh, a company gives their employee four hours per week to work under my guidance, or under my supervision to do some sort of um, more, more research type work related to their, their, their regular job. Um, so yes, and, and, and what do, what do you what do you look for? Like I, I know you mentioned that some of them are master's students, some of them are, you know, professionals who would have to demonstrate to you their pensions for the field. But what what specifically do you look for in terms of people who would be successful under your guidance? Okay, well, uh, first of all, um, attitude, and and I, I kind of you know when I interview them, I want to find out if what is their long term goal. Um, what is their attitude towards doing uh, research? How much time will they have available? How much interest they have? If, uh -huh. if they are just interested in it because they say, okay, well, I, I just want to do data science because it looks like it's a hot field. And, and uh -huh. so there's no- um, No substance. I, yeah, and, and then I look at their, their ability. So I'll see you know, what courses they've taken and, and, uh, um, and then, then I go from there. And, and then I let them know, look, you are going to be working mostly on your own. I will supervise, but having you know thirty plus students to do the same thing, um, I can't spend too much time on you. Um, and if I leave the, the the timelines up to you, you know how fast you work is how fast you publish. So they need um, to have a high degree of independence. Exactly. Um, and so from the from the go, I, 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 I and some of them need help along that. But for the first couple of months, you know, I would sort of give them some guidance, but. Eventually, most of them can do stuff on their own. And what, what prerequisites in terms of degrees and backgrounds? I, I really don't look too much at those, you know, whether it's uh, electrical engineering or, uh, or statistics, um, as long as I could see that you have potential right. to learn, um, then that's all I care about. So, so for instance, yeah. um, I have a lot of statistics people, for instance, and mm -hmm. um, they are good with the mathematical stuff, excellent. 
Um, but when it comes to the programming with Python, et cetera, they, they are a bit weak with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know they would need help in that and, and that's why we help them. Right. And so Py the Python for anyone out there who is an aspiring data scientist is a must have. Try to get yourself up to being proficient and if not advanced in, right. in Python. Yeah. And, and typically statistics students would, would, would use R um, right. and, and, and engineers tend to use MATLAB. Mm -hmm. um, but when you go out in industry like um, when we Facebook. did work with TSCT, for instance, yep. if you have to deploy something, you, you can't really deploy it using MATLAB or R. You have to deploy yeah. it using a, Python, a Python or, or something. So, so right. the statistics students would have that difficulty, uh, but this is where my other students would help them with the programming aspects. Very and vice helpful. versa, the, um, sometimes I have a, a computer science student working on a, a paper and they need help with um, you know, uh, stochastic processes or probability or something. And I would bring in one of the statistics students into that uh, publication and they would contribute uh, with, that, with that. So, so it's a combination of um, backgrounds. Um, I, I, I don't expect everybody to have the background needed to just start off data science immediately. Some of them will be lacking. And um, I just take that into account. I just, just look for the attitude and the, the willingness to, to want to, um, to, to produce some sort of publication within the next four or five months. What, what sorts of projects do you think in the next few months you can showcase that indicate to countries like Trinidad and Tobago, to companies there, the, the types of things that they should be doing with their data? So, so what we typically do is when we go, uh, and these companies come to us, mm -hmm. right? So TSCD came to us, TN Tech came to us, et cetera. Um, so a, a company would come to us and say, look, we want to use our data and, and um, we, ha we have some idea of what we could do, use it for, but we're not clear on, on how it could be used. So we would go in, we would sit with them, get samples of their data sets, um, find out some of the objectives, you know, if they want to increase efficiency, um, look at performance uh, evaluation, et cetera, and then um, come up with some kind of a project. And, and so these interns, um, so let me give you an example with TSTD, for instance. Sure. We, we, we ended up, uh, they, they took five interns. So these interns get a stipend. They work on a problem that um, is beneficial to the company, but they also publish. So they, 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 they gain in, in, in three ways because they, they also use it towards their thesis in some cases. So they, they use it to, for their thesis, they publish, they get an income and the company benefits by, by solving a problem. Um, in the case of TSCT, it was a wide range of, um, of, of areas. Uh, in that case, we had uh, three people from statistics, one from computer science, one from data science. And uh, they worked from HR problems to um, operational problems in the cellular network to um, uh, customer satisfaction problems, et cetera, applying data science. Um, and as I said, each of those resulted in a publication. So it gives the student practical knowledge. It allows the company to evaluate these students. And, and so typically the, the company would actually hire some of these students full-time immediately after um, so, you know, everybody benefits. Um, and the, the, the thing is, that's the good thing about data science. I, I keep telling the students, yeah, um, in certain fields, you probably, there's no potential locally, you know, if, like my, my background is in wireless communications. Now there's, you know, it's useless for me to do wireless communications research in Trinidad because very little of it could be applied locally. Um, in fact, I do some wireless research still, but with somebody from Korea. And so we filed a patent recently, but we filed it in Korea because it, it wouldn't be used in, in Trinidad, for instance. Um, but with data science, there's a, any, you know, any company could use it. And I, so that, that, that's why I say, if you want to have a career that would allow you to stay in Trinidad, data science would be it. Um, on the other hand, companies are now beginning to realize the benefit of data science. Um, you know, before they, um, they didn't see the benefit, you know, they, they, they would see self-driving cars, et cetera, but they didn't see the connection with what they could use it for internally. Um, but I think they are now seeing that and, and appreciate what we could do. Now, one of the issues of course, is they can no longer hire some of these high-end foreign consultants that they, they 
they, they hired in the past, all right? Um, because of foreign exchange issues, et cetera. Um, so they kind of forced the contest, but they, they are also beginning to realize we can do uh, a, lot, um, a lot more than they, they think we can, which is, which is one of my objectives to, to show locally that our students locally could, could produce because some of these foreign ex so-called experts um, just come down and do a shabby job and they go and they collect their big bucks and that's it. Um, so yeah, that, that's my little beef when, when it comes to, to this. But going back to your question about what type of work we do, it's, it's in you know, applying data science, any data set we get in industry. Uh, it could be things like optimization, um, doing you know, spatial temporal optimization of um, gas delivery, um, there's a whole range of, of, of topics we work on. Um, is, we looked at work uh, doing stuff in, in smart grids for the power company, looking at fault detection algorithms. Um, with um, with insurance companies, we work with you know about three. We work with three insurance companies right now, so we have to be careful sometimes that we don't share too much information across companies. Um, but um, it's very interesting to see the fact that we have so much interesting data that could be utilized. The, the, the thing is that some of these companies do not realize that they cannot solve some of their problems by using foreign off-the-shelf tools because it does not apply to our environment, either because it, it, it was developed for a larger scale or the constraints were completely different. Um, things like what features do you use in coming up with an insurance premium. The ones you would use in the US would be different to what you would want to use in Trinidad. And, and we've shown them these things. So to summarize, you've created a path to excellence in the field of data science for any professional locally who would seek to look at the problems that uh, an environment like Trinidad and Tobago has and, and seek to become the very best in the field. And, and, and they can do that through you or one of the, the efforts you've been leading. Yes. That's, that's really terrific. Um, well, one, and, thing I would, one, one thing yeah. I would want to bring up as well is one, one issue we have locally as well is compensation. Mm -hmm. And um, what is happening though is these interns, when they go in and they get hired, they actually ask for a very high salary and they get it because I think the companies now realize that this type of talent, you know, to keep it, they have to pay well. And, and we've actually seen um, offers go up and up over time. Yeah, so to build on that, so for those who are also realizing that this is a field that is in global demand and are aspiring to solve similar problems globally, you your efforts have attracted the likes of, I guess, in my opinion, the world's leading AI company, NVIDIA, to, mm -hmm. to help you and, and support uh, some of the efforts. Can you talk a little bit about what, what aspects of what you're doing you felt um, invited a company like NVIDIA to, to say yes to supporting you? Well, yeah, so NVIDIA, um, as you know, Torian approached us um, and, and I met with him you know, about two years ago and he would like to contribute um, uh, through NVIDIA. And, and so initially I had some of my students work with him on, on coming up and uh, doing blogs, for instance, mm -hmm. on technologies um, and, um, so the, the, the issue is that we have limited resources, especially when it comes to computer resources and companies like NVIDIA could help, it, help us with those things as yeah. well as help us. Um, re remember we, we are, uh, have limited supervision of data science students at UE. I mean, I, I, I supervise, but to be clear, uh, my background is wireless communications, uh, optimization yeah. as well. Um, so having some of these experts from NVIDIA and Google, et cetera, would definitely help um, create better, um, better uh, professionals uh, locally as well. Right, and you're referring to Tori and Daya, who's one of our leads at, at NVIDIA, that's right. part of our extended group. But, but what, what would you say were the reasons Tori and decided to support our humble efforts way over here. And people in California don't even know where Trinidad and Tobago is. So how did, what, what, what standards do you feel you've set that allowed him to bring you in, you guys into the NVIDIA 
Global's fair Silicon Valley fold? Well, I think he, you know, he, um, he saw that we are capable of doing probably not at the level, international level yet in certain mm -hmm. areas, but he saw we have the potential and he wants us to, to, to use our potential to get up to the standard where he could then say, oh, um, I could recommend this student uh, for a full-time job at NVIDIA or recommend him for an internship at NVIDIA. And I think that's the, the ultimate goal to, to have these companies um, hire some of these uh, students I have. Um, and now I encourage my students, whether through academia or industry, to get experience abroad if possible. Um, in the hope that they eventually come back and, and help, you know, later, later in their life. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's important uh, for those who can to get some exposure internationally, because just having local uh, experience, you know, gives you a, a false impression of, um, of things. You know, uh, for instance, you know, a, a lot of people would see an idea and say, oh, that's an innovative idea. But it's not really innovative, you know, because um, if you look at it, it's, it's something that's available in other countries. And, and that, that exposure with what's going on internationally is good. Terrific, terrific. Really amazing stuff. Really amazing stuff. Uh, with all of this that you have going on, Patrick, uh, do you have time to read still? I never liked reading. <laughs> so it's not a matter of still or not. I, I never read that much. Um, I know you 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 you, you, you had asked if uh, um, to provide some some examples of, of the the last thing I probably read is a, a, talking about an actual book. Yeah. Is um, a book by a, a guy called Sadhguru 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 on inner engineering, where it, it shows you how to um, improve yourself um, by engineering yourself in internally. So it, it's, not, it's not really a technical book, but um, but the, the way I, I get information is by skimming um, magazines or, or, or technical uh, uh, journals. Um, Any, so any like ones that. in particular that, that you feel are relevant to the field? Well, I, I triply, um, but because I am in the IEEE Communication Society, I typically follow their magazines um, on wireless communications. Mm -hmm. um, I do. I am a member of ACM as well, and, mm -hmm. and I, I look at some um, stuff there as well. The Association for Computing Machinery. Yeah, associate yeah. right. Um, but in terms of reading actual books, um, uh, yeah, I haven't, haven't read in a while. Um, in terms of podcasts, you asked about that as well, but. Um, I don't listen to podcasts. I, I did participate in, in, in a couple. There's a, there's a very good one, ICT Pulse, mm -hmm. by somebody called Michelle Morias. Okay. Um, and she covers uh, technology in the Caribbean. So it's a, a very good, um, so you could probably Google it, ICT Pulse. Um, in terms of YouTube channels, um, which you also mentioned, I, I, I check to see what channels I have on my, uh, I just have one on, on yoga, the one I follow for, for my yoga class, and my daughter, Trishes. She's a performer, and, and so I follow her on, on YouTube as well. Um, Terrific. So, yeah. So, in terms of learning new stuff, I tend to learn on demand. So, if a student comes to me and, and with an idea and I need to learn something to keep up with what he has to, to do, then I would, you know, Google and, and get a good tutorial on it or, or some textbook and learn that specific aspect of it. But in terms of just reading, yeah, I haven't been doing much of that. What do you think is gonna happen over the next five years and how does that relate to what young folks thinking about their career should be focused on? Well, yeah, over the, you know, things are changing rapidly um, in terms of how we work, where we work, um, and I think that would that would cause cause major shifts. And in terms of a career, I think you have to, to to be prepared to learn constantly, because things are changing constantly. You have to look ahead next ten years and see what will be um, useful at that point in time, and start learning from now. Um, so, 
I see it as an interesting time because people would be allowed to learn a lot more than they would have learned in the past. In the past, you know, you had a job. In fact, I have some friends who've been in a position for, the, for 30 years doing research on, you know, a specific area. Um, and they've become experts in that area, they, 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 you know. Um, but I think with the, uh, with, with the internet and the, 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 the way we are now able to learn things um, with online classes, et cetera, it would change things in such a way that um, we should be constantly learning and changing our careers dynamically. What do you think you'll be doing in five years yourself, if you were to take a guess? Well, what to be doing? Yeah, I, I, um, I have been thinking about that. Um, I, I want to continue helping uh, students at UE, um, but at some point, I, I'm, I'm hoping some of them will graduate, get faculty positions, and be able to take over for me. Um, and uh, but I, I, I will, uh, I will probably continue doing research. Um, probably you know stop the uh, uh, teaching but um, just 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 research I, I just enjoy being at home doing research and um, have any flexibility to travel and yeah so that, that's what I plan to do if, uh, in the next five years just do some more traveling um, probably do like my son he plans to just move around and work from different places so maybe <laughs> I'll follow him so, any final? thoughts or words of wisdom for our audience? Well, um, I, I would say, you know, for those of you who are now um, starting off, either from, you know, uh, high school, um, uh, uh, university or, or early career, just do something you enjoy doing and, and just make sure it's something you have a natural knowledge in. Some people are good in certain areas and some are not. Um, I, I've had students come to me and say they wanna do research and they are bright, but I know that it's not in them to do it. And I, and, and I tell them, look, you know, this is not for you. You are good at ABC, why not try that instead? So I would say, yeah, follow, follow your passion, but ensure that it aligns with your ability and ignore all the stuff with money, et cetera, that will come. Um, over time, as long as you you do what you like, that's that's how I. And again, the three things I look for in a job is um, flexibility, being able to work when I want and where I want, um, interest in work, and then of course, yeah, um, benefits or compensation. But the first two are, are more more important to me, and so I would advise people just be happy in what you do. Fantastic, fantastic advice. Well, it's been a privilege to spend the time with you, Dr. Patrick Hussain, as a pioneer in the internet in Trinidad, in the Caribbean, uh, such a, an avid researcher and world learner and teacher. And um, we hope to continue to hear more from you as things progress in the field of AI, data science, and machine learning. Thanks very much for having us. Well, thanks for having me, Jeff, and, and I, I hope this is informative to, 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 to the budding data scientists out there. Terrific. Okay, all the best. All right, thanks. Thanks for listening to today's interview with Dr. Patrick Hosein. Some things to take away are the high school education that you get in the Caribbean is top-notch. Local companies can innovate without waiting to follow what is done globally, the next opportunity is in algorithm development for apps, and you can be part of the global AI community from wherever you are. In your job in your future, you'll have to be constantly learning and dynamically changing your career. So just get started. Remember that Caribbean heritage is a great asset for your professional career, so take advantage of it and keep working on your skills. Later.